Uh, thanks for coming this. Uh, thank you for coming this month. I'm Jamil. I'm the this time presenting the news. Um, do you wanna maybe I'll start by myself and then everyone introducing themselves. I'm Jamil. I work at Pivotal on Java, Ruby, Go. But I'm I like Java. <laughs> cool. Thank you, everyone. So I'll start maybe with the news. The slides are a bit different to this week. It's blue. So. Oracle, they released the JTPC drivers. You can get them now through Maven repos. You don't need to go. <laughs> yep, finally. <laughs> you don't need to go and download it from some website that you need to Google every single time. If you can memorize that, I have a prize for you. <laughs> uh, so that, that's a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe, probably, it's not related to Java, but a bit, maybe. So Docker, uh, they republished, or actually, they announced the enterprise doc center where you can run Docker containers for enterprise things between quotations. I guess that's their way of competing with other people. I don't know. It seems interesting. People like Docker. So if some company they need Docker run somewhere, they will. It's interesting thing maybe to read about. And there was an interesting, um, interesting actually topic I was reading about that what's the difference between a web container and Docker and like why do I need like the job like it's a ready container right why do I need it and it was like it's it was on reddit slash r slash java it was an interesting read actually and uh, maybe Jonathan they, he mentioned that last time I'm not sure but it's really worth mentioning that JDK 9 they're getting rid of the Java browser plugin so there's no more like this squiggly thing. Do you really install it or update it? And then it will not update on Mac and it's creating. So they're really getting rid of that, uh, which I like. Uh, who uses JUnit? Perfect. OK. So, uh, so JUnit, like a few months ago, they released, uh, actually, they made an announcement. They want to uh, use the new Java 8 features to include it in the G, like it has been JUnit 4.3, I think, since forever. So they really want to include the Java 8 features and then they want to cr create something called the JUnit Lambda, which is JUnit 5. And they have released like maybe like a couple of weeks ago, the first alpha version. And I think it's definitely worth it because uh, I think they asked for a certain amount of funding and they, cut, they got maybe four times or five times more what they wanted. So they really, it seems, they have good people working on it. So it's a very good piece of technology that if you want to check it out. Oh, that's it. Uh, it was maybe February was a month of not too many Java updates. Anybody have any news to share interesting or any kind of Java news, non-Java? OK, cool. I have maybe one I forgot. It's, it's not even related to Java, but something nice I, it happened on. Two weeks, weekends ago, I was playing around with Spring, and I was like to test it. And then I need Redis because I had Redis running. And then, OK, there's an embedded Redis just ready to use. It was like, oh, should I do that? And then just it works out of the box. I was happy for the test. If, you wanna, if you're working with Redis and you want to test, it seems to be just, it, it didn't crash the first time. And just I just works, just if somebody. Cool, thank you very much. So presenter today is Dan and Jonathan. Um, please welcome, I think, Dan or something first. Cool. Okay, so um, I'm going to do a little talk, maybe about 20 minutes, on um, a new certificate authority that's come out a couple years ago called Let's Encrypt. And uh, how many of you have heard of it? How many have used it? Nobody's used it. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll do the presentation then. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, evangelism, um, which is why everyone should use HTTPS for everything. Um, you, uh, you really need to worry about privacy these days. Everybody's looking at what everyone's doing online. Your internet provider is, every advertiser is, uh, Starbucks is if you're using their open Wi-Fi, the, you know, the government, the police, everybody's basically watching what you're doing. And it's, it's not entirely paranoia. They are actually keeping track. Um, 
Authenticity is a really big deal lately too. If you're working, if you're on um, an internet provider like a cable modem, on Bell, on Rogers, um, it happens more and more that they actually edit your web pages as they are transferred through the network. So whether it's just to put up a pop-up message that says, oh, you're running out of limit, or to even replace advertising, which some providers have been doing. Um, it's, if you want to see the page as it was served, you should make sure that it's over HTTPS. Um, if you're working as uh, developing web applications, a lot of platforms are forcing developers to use it now. Um, with iOS, you have to ask Apple in your manifest file for a special exception to be able to use HTTP in your application. So it's, uh, it's something that you should definitely be doing. Um, SEO, Google has said that they're going to rank HTTPS pages higher in PageRank than HTTP going forward. So if it's a secure page, it's going to rank higher. And this SEO is a pretty clear reason to do it. And it just looks cool. You look more modern if you have that little green lock icon. You know, it's like you're, you're a hip new service. So you don't need to go to secure dot or click to visit the secure version of the website or anything else. It should just be the default. Um, a lot of people have talked about performance of HTTPS. And with modern hardware, it really doesn't ma matter anymore. There's, you know, I mean, if you're doing super high performance, there's dedicated hardware. For a regular site, you know, your Pentium will do it and not really sweat that much. Um, and for overall streaming, there's a couple really neat tests. Um, there's a JavaScript test that loads 100 images using HTTP and HTTPS in parallel in your browser, and it lets you just see how fast it goes. And the HTTPS one usually wins, which I thought was quite interesting. It does more efficient streaming and more efficient setup like that. Um, so these uh, people call themselves Let's Encrypt, and they want to make this easier. They want to see everybody using HTTPS. They want to see the entire web be encrypted. They want to make the process as easy as possible for everyone. They want to make it free, um, which is a big deal right now. You can, get, you can get free certificates, but you have to deal with credit cards and sketchy providers and people you don't really want to give all your personal information to, and you, you don't really want to go there necessarily. And they want to encourage browsers to deprecate plain HTTP. Um, Right now, there's a, a little thing that always bugs me with browsers. If you have an unsigned certificate, it's considered worse than no encryption at all. And I mean, you can load an unencrypted page, no warnings, no errors, nothing. If you load a self-signed one, the browser's like, oh my god, something's wrong. So it's just interesting. They want to they get rid of plain HTTP. They want to make everybody encrypted with a real certificate and sort of level the playing field. So the people behind it um, are a lot of big names. And They've incorporated a company called the Internet Security Research Group. Um, there is an I there. It's cut off. And they're coming from all over the place. Um, Mozilla and University of Michigan are the two big players that really kicked it off. And um, they've got a board that covers a lot of major providers. And they've got sponsorships from a lot of big companies who are interested in seeing the web be encrypted. So a bit of history on the project. Um, they first kicked it off in 2013. They incorporated the company. They kept it pretty quiet for a year and started doing conference presentations. Um, they presented at the Chaos Communication Congress. That's where I first saw about it in 2014. Um, they've generated their first major root certificate in June of last year and had that cross signed by Iden Trust, which means that it is a valid certificate in every browser and makes every browser happy and completely works. Um, at least browsers that are like less than five years old or something like that. So it's pretty solid. Uh, they issued their first official certificate in September and opened their services to public beta in December this year. And as of, as of January, they've issued over 200,000 certificates. So it's not, not small time. It's a, they're really, really kicking things out. So in beta, they're the fifth largest issuer of non-expired SSL certificates right now. If you look at if you look at the stats on it, um, I think that stats from Mozilla Mozilla Telemetry that rates it as the fifth highest. So um, I've got a slide about what you don't need in order to use Let's Encrypt. Um, there is no user registration. You don't have to tell them who you are. When you make a certificate, you can register an email address, which they will use to notify you if there's any problems, but otherwise you don't have to tell them anything. 
You don't have to pay them. It's the service is completely free. You never have to renew the certificate because the entire system is based on automation and your cron job will renew your certificates for you. You never have to go back to their website or click buttons or anything else. It's all scripted. It's all automated. Um, they have a very efficient way to do multiple domains in a certificate. They don't do wildcards, but they will let you do up to 200 domains or something like that per certificate. And you, you won't get long expiry times, which means it has advantages in that you don't have to be quite as paranoid about your certificates. If, if something goes wrong, it's going to be dead in 90 days. You can get a new one. Um, and because of the automated renewal, you'll, you will never expire anyway because you'll be renewing it every month or so. So you'll have a fresh certificate more often. Technology, you, know, you won't have to go back to your issuer if the technology changes, if it needs a new hash type, if it needs something else. Yeah. Did you have a question? It's 90 days right now. They're thinking about changing it. But right now, the certificates are for 90 days. So um, a little bit about how you get started with it. Um, my bullets are cut off. But there's um, a protocol they've developed called ACME, which is the Automatic Certificate Management Environment. And um, you need a client that implements that protocol. So they provide one. You don't have to write your own, um, and it's, it's pretty robust. So you start with that. You grab it off, off GitHub. I think it's mostly in Python. Um, you request a certificate from them, and there's a, couple, there's a challenge you have to answer to prove that you actually control the domain that you're requesting a certificate for. And there's a whole bunch of automated ways to do that. Um, and then install the certificate that you get. So that, that's really all there is to it. There's a few few details you have to worry about, but that's essentially the workflow. And a renewal, you just do the loop again. So you have to be able to prove that you are authorized to issue a certificate for your domain. And to do that, you have to prove that you can control it. And um, normally, the way it does that is to serve um, a cryptographic response from your web server that lets encrypt servers can read and verify that you can actually put a file in the web root of your web server. And that's good enough. That gives you a domain validated certificate, and that's all they really need from you. So if you use their tools uh, with Apache, it knows all about Apache config files and can put in the web root files and edit the config file, turn on SSL. It knows how to completely configure SSL for it. Um, it's very automated. Nginx is automated, but they call it, they call it beta right now. They, it's like experimental. Um, it's not as good at, at Nginx config files. Um, and you can do it manually. You can tell the client, this is the directory where my web root is. Connect to me and try it. And it's got a, a, a fourth mode, which is a, a standalone mode where the client actually becomes a web server, listens on port 443, and Let's Encrypt connects back to you at the domain name you're trying to get a certificate for and talks to its client and says, yes, OK, we've closed the loop. We knew you have the control over this. And then it will issue you a certificate. Um, of course, this is um, a Java meeting. And nothing's ever quite that easy. Um, Java's got its own key packaging format and its own strange configurations for web servers with SSL. Um, whether I don't know if you've ever done SSL with Jetty or Tomcat or anything. It's not quite the most fun. but um, once you repackage the keys and get it into a Java key store file, put it in the right place, uh, it's all good. So I've got a couple little examples. Um, with Apache, you do a git clone of their repo into a directory and cd into it. And then run let's encrypt auto and tell it that it's working with Apache. You tell it what what domain uh, hosts you're building a certificate for, and it does the rest. If everything works, um, it will ask you to approve the license. The first time, on, on, an initial, on an initial certificate, they'll say, you know, type yes or something to, to approve our, our license. And it offers you the chance to put in an email address for notifications. It generates certificates, installs them in Apache, turns on SSL, you're good to go. Um, so it's super easy there. Um, 
obviously, if your Apache configuration is, is strange and it's like multiple SSL virtual hosts and you've got all things going on, you'll have to take a bit more care with it. But um, really, it, it does go that easily on a simple configuration. So a more complicated one, um, I, I was using a home automation program called OpenHab, which has an embedded Jetty server in it. And this is kind of a worst case Java, Java mess for this. So I, I wrote a little config file. Um, you put in a domain and a password because you need um, a key, key store password for Java. So I run let's encrypt. This is maybe a bit small, but um, I run it in certificate only standalone mode. Um, so I stop the service, do the standalone mode, have Let's Encrypt connect to me and authenticate my server, and then use OpenSSL and Java key tool to convert the certificate into Java format and put it in the right directory for Jetty. Clean up my temp files. <laughs> and then restart my service. And I run this on a cron every month, and I always have a fresh certificate. It just goes and does its thing at 2 AM, takes my server down for like five minutes. Um, obviously, this wouldn't be so good in production, but there, there are ways around it. And you can always write your own client for the protocol if you absolutely need it to be seamless. So certificate renewal is just rerunning the certificate process with a renew command line option, which means it won't prompt you for anything. It won't ask you for email addresses. It won't ask you for licensing. It just issue you a new certificate and go. Um, revoking a certificate. Where did my revoking slide go? Um, it's got a revoke command that talks back to the CA, adds your certificate to the revocation list, and it's, it's there instantly. Um, so a few other interesting things. You can use certificates for HAProxy. There's also a brand new plugin for HAProxy that lets it do web root online. Um, using the URL remapping to a Ruby script or something. But um, if you terminate your SSL in some way other than Java, which you should probably be doing, then you can, uh, you can deal with it that way. The certificates can also be used for web uh, or for email. So if you're running email, if you're running an SMTP server, if you're running IMAP server, if you use the standalone mode, if it authenticates your domain, you can take those certs and just use them for your email servers. Um, it's a bit less automated, but they do work very well. And if you have a special, special needs, you can always write your own client. The Acme protocol is fairly subtle. There's a lot, of, a lot of moving parts to it because of the network communication between Let's Encrypt and your server and the challenge and response cryptography and things. You have to get it right. But you can totally make your own client. And the whole thing's open source, um, which is really cool. You can base it on their client. And their, their client actually has a plug-in architecture, so you can even work with it that way. So I've done um, four or five services now, a couple with work in like a test environment and a couple from home with Let's Encrypt. And it's worked every time for me. It's been, it's been really solid. I've never found a browser where it complains or says this is a, a good certificate. Um, so I've been really happy with the experience. And it's really nice to support Mozilla and to support um, EFF and their project. So I think it's, it's really fun to get in early and try it. Um, this is another slide. If you're doing, if you're doing SSL, this is just, just bonus, uh, bonus content. But Mozilla's got this great SSL config generator. So I don't know if you've ever tried to uh, figure out the cipher parameter for um, OpenSSL and what, what's safe to accept and what isn't safe to accept right now, and it's always changing based on the news. Um, they, you can tell them what tools you're using, and they'll, they'll spit out a config for you, which I've used many times. And it uh, usually ends up with an A or a B in the Qualsys uh, SSL analyzer. So that's always good. So nothing's perfect. Um, Let's Encrypt still has some, some issues. So it, good and bad, it has that 90-day lifetime. So you really can't use it without automation. Um, there's not really a good business process where you actually want to be manually renewing certificates every 90 days. So if you can't figure out how to automate your process, you can't really use Let's Encrypt. Um, there are usage limits as well. Uh, where's my notes? In the, um, 
in the beta until they get it fully live. Uh, you can re only register 10 domains per three hours, which isn't really that bad for most people. <laughs> um, and you can, you can only have five certificates per domain per seven days. So there's a sliding seven-day window, and in that seven-day window, you can only register five certificates under a particular domain. They just don't want people to just pound the server like crazy. Um, so you only get domain validation certificates. You don't get any of the higher levels. You can't get an EV certificate from them. They don't do that. They don't like call your boss or do letterhead or fax things or anything else. The only, th the only certificates they can really make are DV certificates. Um, and they, they are completely transparent, which is good or bad, depending on what you want to do with things. But they publish a list of every certificate they've ever issued. And you can look up every certificate they've ever issued and see all of its stats, when it was issued, when it's expiring, everything. Um, which I, I like. Uh, but if you wanted to do like a whole bunch of internal hosts or something like that on a private system, and you, didn't really, you were doing some security through obscurity, you might not want all those hosts to be in their list. Um, well, yeah. If you're doing it wrong, it's a bad thing. So you cannot get the green bar with testing. Uh, you can't get the solid green bar. You can't get the EV bar with this. You can get a you can get a lock icon. Okay. But you can't get the full EV like eBay or Amazon or those guys. Actually, I don't know if Amazon does EV. Oh, no, I really have my scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. If you're doing it wrong, this is a problem for you. I, I, you know, your DNS may also be doing this. <laughs> um, and if you, have, if you have weird applications, because of this 90-day lifetime, like if you want to put the certificates in like a lights out management card in your server or in your, your PDU or like some sort of like captive web interface thing, there's not really a good way to do it yet. And eventually, what, what the what the concept with Let's Encrypt is, is they want Let's Encrypt functionality to be built into those devices. So the first time you, you, you boot up your Dell DRAC or whatever, it's like, OK, I need to make an SSL certificate. I'm going to go talk to Let's Encrypt. Good, I've got a real one. Um, and never, it, this, their idea is to basically replace self-signed certificates everywhere. Um, hosting providers is another, uh, another place where they really want it to work, like when you have your, your cPanel or whatever, and you, want, you just say, turn on SSL. And off it goes and makes the cert, installs it, does it all. And they want it to be free on providers too. So like, I don't know if you're like Funio and Bluehost and all of those guys, if you're, if you're dealing with them, they want all of those people to be doing SSL by default for everybody by using Let's Encrypt. So that's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, Um, they, you, you still have to prove that you control the, the domain name that you, you're, you're issuing a certificate for. You could buy some, some domain that you're going to use for your internal stuff. Yeah. Put the DNS on externally just long enough to get the cert and then put it away. Yeah, yeah, you totally could. You totally could. But no other provider is really better than that. Like, I don't know if you've, if you've got a Komodo certificate or something recently, like the send an email address to the an email to the address in the in the who is record and you have to click okay on a button that they send you and it's it's like I worked at a place that they used the wildcard card cert for that. They registered a domain, used the wildcard cert, and they got the wildcard cert cert and then they would bring the domain up long, just long enough every <laughs> year to renew the cert and put it away again. Right. But that that's about as good as it gets. Yeah. It's um why is it better than self-signed? I, I guess some, somebody external has verified you, and, and you're in browsers, because there's, the there's this whole weird browser. Forget it. There's a, there's a working group that handles the, the big certificate chain for browsers, and it's like really difficult to, to get part of that and to not get warnings. Um, Let's Encrypt does want to become a first tier um, certificate authority, as opposed to doing the cross-signing thing. They've started the process on the same day as they issued the first certificate. And it's like a two to five year process. Uh, it requires us external audits, and it's, it's a really, really big mess. But they want to get there eventually to be a tier one. And they're uh, different enough from the other tier ones that it will probably take 
Yeah, they'll have to rewrite everything. So it's going to be a big deal. But we shouldn't be using SSL now. <laughs> TLS, yeah. So uh, I didn't do a demo, mainly because risk, because it's all internet, and I don't like to do internet demos. But if you've got your laptop here, give it a try. Like it's it's really that easy. Go to their page, follow their walkthrough, turn on SSL for something, because we probably all have a service somewhere that isn't running SSL and should be. It's worth playing with. Uh, just go go to letsencrypt.org. Doesn't cost anything. Takes you ten minutes if you're running a simple Apache or nginx setup, and turn it on. So, any any questions about it? This is a super quick overview. I didn't get into like any X509 or how certificates work or any of that stuff. Um, I don't think it's that relevant for most people. They just want the green lock and they want their site to be secure. And this does provide that without knowing too many technical details. Yeah. <coughs> All right, let's, <laughs> let's get through this so we can all just drink and stop thinking and drinking at the same time. So, the quick intro to the uh, Hystrix Circuit Breaker project. Anyone familiar with circuit breakers as a concept? Good. If you've been here before, you should be because we had a presentation on them about a year ago. Two years ago? Okay. Yeah, my concept of time is, I don't know, it might have been 10 years ago. But, um, there was, in the past, a presentation on circuit breakers. Anyway, it's on YouTube, yeah. Um, okay, so does anyone use a circuit breaker before I ask why do we need one? In, this, is, uh, this is a circuit breaker on a network call, not on an electrical circuit. It's actually a really poor analogy. We can get into that in a minute. <laughs> It behaves nothing like an actual electrical circuit breaker, <laughs> but okay. So why do we need a circuit breaker? We will turn to emojis to answer this question. So here's my distributed system. I've got a happy gang of calling services. This is my sort of horizontally, I drew it sideways. Pretend this is horizontally distributed calling services here. They look vertical, I know. Um, and they're all calling into some sort of thing that fronts a database. There might be multiple instances of that, but it's harder to draw, so we'll just assume there's one for now. And that thing is uh, chugging away, satisfying database queries in some fashion. Okay. And then one of the calling services goes bananas, maybe because it got like a whole bunch of requests and it's just going to try sending them all, or maybe it's, it's internally flaky for some reason, and, and it's got some retry logic where it's like retrying the same query over and over again. So yeah, eventually database gets a little bit stressed out. It's like, I don't know, it's more queries per second than I'm used to. And then of course, the old data API starts running out of threads, or, or whatever it's doing. And then of course, um, Everybody's retrying now. That's the best thing you could possibly do. Because right, when a query fails, just retry, right? If it's taking too long, try again. What do you do when a web page won't load fast enough? Try again. Right, so here we go. Let's all just go to town on the data API because it's too slow. So then, you know. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> now we're not so smart. OK, everything's dead now. Yeah. So, can we do better? Would there be a different pattern of network communication that might have ended it in a happier way? All right, everyone's happy. Number two goes berserk. Database gets stressed out. Data API gets stressed out, starting to respond slower. Now what does everybody do? They're like, ah, yeah, that guy doesn't look too happy. So <laughs> now what we do, in, instead of retrying over and over and over again, we'll just not actually send through all of the requests that we would have. So we're still like getting, there's an onslaught coming from this side of lots and lots of calls into the calling service. And for most of them, it's just going to respond right away and say either, sorry, I can't help you right now, or if you're lucky and you're in a business where you could fill in some, some sort of default value, 
to kind of paper over the database failure. You could return that. Um, Hystrix in particular was developed by Netflix. It's a, one of the Netflix open source software things. Um, so a, a canonical example for circuit breakers now because of the Netflix use case is if the uh, data API in the middle there was the recommendation service and you go to the Netflix movies list page and the recommendation service is slow or down, they can just return to you a list of like popular shows that's hard coded. It might be updated once a day. It doesn't I'm require. Sure you were going to say, you know, if, you can't, if they can't get your show, they just give you House of Cards. House of Cards, <laughs> yeah. Pretty much just watch House of Cards and, and then we'll be back later. Like yeah. <laughs> so this is what happens. And then eventually, you know, the database isn't stressed out anymore. The data API is starting to respond in a reasonable amount of time. And then everything's back to normal again. So we're good. Yeah. So that's, that's why you want to use a circuit breaker on every outbound network call from whatever you're writing. Because you can have lots of happy emojis instead of dead emojis. Yeah. <laughs> So how does it work? It's as simple as that. <laughs> this, is why you, this is why you don't make your own, right? They made one already. There's, not only is this a weird flow diagram, but it's got a lot of like, thread boundaries being crossed in various places. So even given this, which probably took them years to figure out, you could probably not write it correctly within months. That's, that's my guess, anyway. I've, I've written enough multi-threaded code to, whoops, not write any more multi-threaded code. <laughs> so essentially what happens is when a command comes in, the command is, the, is sort of the protected unit of work, the, the unit of work that's protected by the circuit breaker. We check, is the circuit breaker open? Open means, like that's going back to that poor analogy, if the circuit breaker is open, no electricity goes through. So if the network circuit breaker is open, no network requests go through. Except some do. So, you know, <laughs> the, the analogy breaks down really fast. So, <laughs> to know if the service that you're protecting has recovered, you have to send some requests through sometimes to find out if it can respond. So, if the circuit breaker is open, maybe one out of 100 requests will go through. And if that request comes back and it's successful and it happened in a reasonable amount of time, that's enough to close the circuit again. That's this box in the middle. We're saying mark success, you say a duration. If the circuit is open, we're going to close it and reset all the counters, and then full traffic can resume. Um, marking failures is a lot more complicated. That's this bottom part of the flow. The way that they've modeled failure is to keep buckets full of statistics. And if there have been enough failures recently, give, that's enough to open the circuit. And there's lots of good defaults. I'm, I'm using this in a project right now. And um, I'm just using all the defaults because I don't presume to know better. And the defaults seem to be fine. Um, but you can tweak all that stuff at your own peril. So I'm going to show a demo of this actually working. There's some neat uh, visibility and monitoring stuff that comes with it. Uh, there are a few bonus features that I'm not using. So one of them is request collapsing. This is really cool. The only reason I'm not using this is because the services that are downstream of me don't support responding to multiple things in one request, so I can't use this. But I would otherwise. So top scenario is where you're saying, OK, we've got a whole bunch of API requests coming in. We're executing five different commands for different types of data, or sorry, the same type of data, different parameters. And we're going to run five network requests out to the backend API. So no, no bonus there. But what if we get five requests really close to each other in time? We can collapse them all into one request that asks for five things and then returns one time. That saves a ton of network communication and probably makes the thing that you depend on, the, the downstream API, not have to work so hard because it's, t it's like one-fifth the amount of network connections coming in now. So 
That's really neat. And, and the Collapser API is pretty simple to figure out. It's just an interface you implement. It gives you a list of requests. You take that list of requests and turn it into one request. And then when the response comes back, it gives you the response and you return it into a list of responses. So you can, it's just general. You can do anything you want with it. So that's, that's fun. And then the other one that's really neat is request caching. So this lets you write code that's really naive, where say there's a whole bunch of different code in your service that all wants to know user account information for the same user. You can just have all the code pretend like it's going to go ask for the user account fresh. And then Hystrix is smart enough to notice that there's multiple threads of execution that are asking for the same user account at the same time. And it will just send one request and then give them all the response back when it comes. So that's kind of cool, too. We're not using this because our services are really small and they don't ask for the same thing twice. OK, so that's all the slides I have. We can try a demo. See how it's going. OK, so the first thing we'll look at is the flaky service. So it's just uh, like one, one endpoint called flake out. It takes an uh, argument called probability. And uh, then it makes a random number. If the random number is less than, I think Max found the messages. <laughs> Yeah, so the probability is a number from 0 to 1 that says, how, how likely is it this service is going to take a really long time to respond? And then it returns a message. The message is, is dependent on the probability that the service will be slow. If it's more than 80% probable that the service will be slow, it's a Ruby simulator. If it's more than 0% probable that the service will be slow, it's just a flaky service. And if it's 0%, it's like a rock solid service. OK, so I'm going to run this app. We can try it out directly. OK, started. So I got that one running on port 9080. OK. So we got rock solid service responding. If the probability is one that it's flaky, there. OK, we got a Ruby simulator working perfectly. So you can see it's taking longer now to respond, some random amount of time that it sleeps before responding. And we could have something in the middle, like OK, sometimes it, it's instant. There was an instant one. And sometimes it takes a little while there. OK, so that's working as expected. Next project, we have a consumer. My screen was bigger when I was doing this. OK, so the consumer service is using Hystrix to call the flaky service. We're just injecting the URL to the flaky service here. And we're taking, it's the same kind of call. We have, this one is called call remote. And we're taking a probability argument. And then we're passing it through to the flaky service and executing on that. So here's the part we've been waiting for. Here's how the Hystrix command is structured. So the way you make one, a protected piece of code that does something under the protection of the Hystrix circuit breaker is you extend a class called Hystrix command. And the type parameter is the type that you return from the command. So the one method you're required to implement is called run. And run, in this case, returns that type. It's string, in this case. And I'm just using the spring rest client to get from this endpoint. So that's easy enough. So this is going to fail if, if it times out, right? If, if the flaky service that we're calling takes longer than the allowable timeout to respond, then 
Hystrix will fail this call. And it will call instead get fallback. And so here I'm saying you got the fallback response. So we can try this out. Let's see what I've got the timeout is set to five seconds right now. Let me how long should we give it? Like 100 milliseconds, maybe? Is that too much? Too much? 50? Four? I ran this with 100 concurrent threads in, uh, in JMeter, and it was responding in 0, 1, or 2 milliseconds. So four should be enough as long as we're rock solid, right? Let's give it a try. We can try that. We'll, we'll go in here. Let's see. Flaky service direct. Wait, I should save this first in case I didn't earlier. OK, let's turn that down so it doesn't take so long. OK, so if we make a call with a probability of 0, from uh, 10 concurrent users 100 times each. We can look at the response times here. Just take all that stuff away. They're all yellow. What did I do? Oh, here. I changed the name of the endpoint. Let's try that. There we go. Oh, look, no, it's up to seven now. Four is not going to be enough. What if we run it again? Five, four. OK, well, it's right on the edge. Let's see. So this is our call to the caller service. We'll set the probability to 0 so we have a chance. Whoops. What have I done? Zero. We got the fallback response. Every time. Let's give ourselves 10 milliseconds. Okay. OK, I started. Hey, we're up and running. OK, so it's rock solid now. But if we have like a 20% probability, oh, there, we got to fall back. Oh, it's fine. So there's another piece here of interest. There's actually a, um, what have I done? Oh, I know. I didn't show you the, the third thing. OK, so this is a simple way of, there's a Hystrix dashboard application. It's mostly just a client-side JavaScript application. The way that Hystrix works, it, it can publish a stream of metrics to any interested parties. And by default, it's an endpoint that just sends server sent events forever, every like 100 milliseconds of the accumulated metrics. So if I run this, the Hystrix dashboard thing, it's got really two parts. One is a bunch of static files that serves the client side application that gives you the dashboard. And the second part is a servlet that acts as a proxy so that you don't have to deal with cross-origin resource problems. Uh, so the proxy just goes and gets the SSE from wherever and gives it back to you. So let's try that again. There we go. OK, so now if we start refreshing this, we should see there. So the green ones, there's a color code here, success. Does that show up in the, yeah. Uh, success ones are green. Short-circuited means requests that we didn't even try. 
That was like the, the, the sly face emoji response of like, this thing is too slow and I'm not going to send requests. Timeouts are the ones that we actually sent, but they took too long. Rejected means that we, we have our own concurrency. There's a pool size of 10 here. So there's a, a hard limit as configured in this pool. If we have more than 10 requests at a time, we're just going to reject more. So we're like taking an active role in protecting whatever is downstream of us by enforcing no more than 10 concurrent requests from this service. And then a failure is a call that we actually did, but came back with a non 200 response. So, whoops, wrong thing. Oh, so there was a fallback, and you can see there we had an error. So the now we're getting lots of timeouts. Circuit is still closed though, so every request is going through. And Chrome has this kind of lockout where I can't refresh too often. So we're gonna have to move to JMeter now to really exercise this thing. So everyone with me so far, what, what we're seeing makes sense? Okay, so let's, let's push it harder. Let's see, I have to open the one that calls the other service. So here we're calling it in rock solid mode with a failure probability of zero. And I've added in a response assertion as well so that we can see how many requests did not include the word fallback. And we'll just graph those results. So this should take all this stuff away again. It's all yellow again. Maybe. No, some of them worked. I think we're just seeing a lot of uh, assertion failures in there. So we, we were able to break the rock solid service with a, how many? 10 users concurrently. Let's give it a slightly larger, oh here, yeah, let's watch that as well. I'm just gonna run it one more time with the same settings. We watch the circuit breaker as we run it. So this part's fun too, because the, the services that I'm building that are using this right now, they're all running in a cloud so it's kind of arm's length, but it's really nice to have this view. And you can actually, there's another component called Turbine that can aggregate Hystrix streams from multiple apps and then you can watch them all in one. Uh, and it's nice to have this visibility into the system. So let's see, run it again. Yeah, we are getting failures there. There's, oh yeah, see we're getting 11 milliseconds in the 99th percentile, so let's, let's turn it up. Allow it a bit more time. Give it like 50, that should be enough. going. That's what we want. Okay, let's run it. That looks better. That thing stopped. I'm going to refresh it. Let's try again. No, still failing. Look at that. There's still some 50 millisecond responses there. We do have a flake out probability of zero. I don't know. Maybe. What do we have here? Oh, here. It looks good. Median is 15. 
but we're getting some, I don't know why, it's maybe all the other things, because they're all in the same computer. No, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> okay. Let's try giving it 100 milliseconds, see what it can do. Or actually, you know what, we could, we could also just give it like a second and see what the 99th percentile response time is and then set it to that. Okay. I feel confident that we could respond to that request in one second. <laughs> Me too. Okay, let's try it. The clear button is out here somewhere. Okay. I don't know why this stops every time I switch away from it. It's a mystery. Oh, because I restarted the service, that's why. Okay, go. There we go, that's better. So we're getting lots of green. There, let everything through. Oh wow, look at that. So it looks like my, my four core laptop couldn't do all of those things at the same time in a reasonable amount of time. So anyway, that's pretty much all I had to show. Be happy if anyone has questions, I can try to answer them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they use this for, as far as I know, they, they, they they're very open about where they use it and how much, and a lot of the advice in the in the documentation about how should you configure this, they tell they, they usually the first paragraph about how should you configure this is an explanation of how all of the Netflix ones are configured, and then it tells you what your options are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Well, you can protect any code you want using a circuit breaker, but it's typically a network call. So if you have, let's say, 50 separate uh, microservices, how many of these do you have? Uh, we have, right now, like, I can speak specifically, we, we have eight different microservices, and for every outbound network call in each of the eight services, we have a circuit breaker wrapping it. So in total, I think we have about 14 circuit breakers in the whole distributed system. Um, and then you can, there's two things in the circuit breaker. Uh, there, here's, here's the actual circuit breaker. You can give any name you want to the command group, as well as you can assign it to a thread pool. So the thread pool is, this part down here, and that controls how much maximum concurrency there is. And then the command group is the thing that actually keeps the statistics about each individual request. So the thread pool is more about throttling maximum concurrency, and the command is more about measuring response times and response success rates. And the circuit gets opened or closed based on the command stuff, but the sort of guaranteed maximum concurrency is managed by the thread pools. So would you ever want to have one thread pool for multiple services, or is that not something you do? Well, for example, we have, we have some use cases in some of our services where they make several calls to the same remote application. So there's a monolith that we call that handles authentication as well as uh, user data requests. And so we don't want to overwhelm it, and we've assigned both of those calls to the same thread pool. Essentially, wh what we're starting with is, and it's working fine for us so far, is a thread pool per remote service. 
And that gives us the ability to control the maximum number of requests we make to that other thing. So as long as the things are separate, we're giving them separate thread pools. Right, but in that other case, it's, it's the same thing, but with different endpoints. Yes, two commands, one thread pool. Yeah, we, we learned a lot. We were doing some load testing just to learn how we should set these, um, like the tuning configuration for how long command timeouts are and what size the thread pools should be. Um, one that happened to us, we, we found out when you're running an application in Cloud Foundry, there is a hard limit of 500 threads per Linux process. It's enforced by the C groups in the container. So um, we w originally, based on the amount of RAM we had in the container, we thought we could do maybe like 1,500 threads. But turns out we couldn't because we could only have up to 500. So we had to balance out our thread usage. Um, you do chew through extra threads this way, right? Because when you have a request that comes in on Tomcat, assuming you're not doing any like non-blocking or reactive style processing, the Tomcat request comes in and uses up a Tomcat worker thread. Then your outbound network request is being managed in a Hystrix thread, thread pool. So you're actually using up two threads blocked on one IO. Um, which, if you're thread constrained, isn't optimal. There is a different mode that you can use Hystrix in. You can set a command to use semaphores to limit concurrency instead of thread pools, and then it uses the same thread as the caller. But um, their warning there is that network timeouts are not as robust as being able to kill a thread. So you run the risk of saturating whatever parent thread pool there was just because the network timeouts don't always work. You can also have like network trickle. Yeah. Like the fact that stuff like that, you're getting a response when it's just extremely slow. Yes. And that, uh, that would kill the semaphore model. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there, that is a, a thing to consider. If you're thread constrained, you have to make some trade-offs. For us, it was reducing the resources for each individual application instance and just having a larger number of instances so that we could have more threads. Or you could go to non-blocking IO. We actually, we had originally coded our first service to use non-blocking end-to-end, but threat stack traces are so nice for debugging. <laughs> and we couldn't prove that we needed that much concurrency per process. So we went back to using blocking I.O. and we'll revisit non-blocking if we have to. But I don't think we'll have to because just for fault tolerance, we need multiple instances of every service anyway. And that's going to give us more than enough concurrency in this case. But if we needed tens of thousands of concurrent requests, we'd have to go back to non-blocking. Um, and interestingly, I didn't talk about that. The execution model here, you get two choices. So here's where we call the command. Execute uses a Hystrix internal thread pool and blocks you until the response comes back. So it's really nice. The other thing you can do here on a Hystrix command is call Q. And that gives you a future. And you can feed that into RxJava really easily and end up doing a complete, like this thing, instead of a string, you can do like a deferred response or deferred result. So you can really easily end up with a full non-blocking picture. It's just when something fails, your stack trace is going to be meaningless, which is why we stopped doing this. But um, you need like an observable future. And then you can essentially give up your Tomcat thread immediately as soon as you've sent the network request. And then you get a callback from the result. And you can use the deferred result to send the response. And then you're not using up any threads at any point in time, because you could also use non-blocking IO. There's 
Like in here I used REST template, but there's also async REST template. So you can actually have a complete end-to-end -end asynchronous everything. You're never actually holding a thread. So you could do tens of thousands of concurrent requests with a 500 thread limit, but debugging would be hard to impossible. So it's possible. Is there an advantage to, to having the circuit breakers, on, circuit breakers on the client as opposed to on the server? Yes, I mean, in our case, the resources that we're protecting are mostly legacy resources. So getting them to change anything is like a six month project. And so we're like, we're talking about having, that we have a geographically distributed, uh, like two different data centers in the US uh, with the API management out front with like regional DNS resolution and, and intelligent routing uh, both regions are active at the same time. We've got multiple instances of every app in each region. But in the back end, there's one SOAP service running in a corporate data center. And if that goes down, then it doesn't matter how fault tolerant we are. So we're really using the circuit breaker to protect the thing we're calling. And that's the common model is that you, like, if something's going wrong from your point of view, stop kicking the thing that's hurt. Like, give it time to stand up again and then call it. So that's, that's really the, the, the advantage of putting it on the client is that if you're the one writing the client, you're in total control and it's easy enough to implement. And you're really protecting the thing that you depend on. Right. And in, like, if you think of the Netflix use cases, their use case tends to be really good for this circuit breaker model because if they can't find your most likely favorite shows in half a second, it's better that they give you a like, vanilla list of favorite shows in half a second than to make you wait five seconds. So that's like the fallback model. We haven't had much use for it in this project. There's nothing we can do except return a kind of specific error to say, like, which backend didn't respond, <laughs> but there's nothing we can fill in here in any of our services. So it depends. I mean, I can think of lots of other use cases that aren't Netflix where a fallback would work, but if you're talking about user specific data, that's rarely a, a useful fallback. Cool. Anything else? Thank <laughs> you.